everybody. I'm Robin Bagwell, and this is my partner in crime, Jan Osborne. And for those of you who don't know us, we met on the tennis court almost 20 years ago. And um, we go way back. The, um, Jan walked up to me, and she's like, gosh, everybody's telling you you look so good. What's going on? I said, well, I'm in AA. I got in about four months ago. And she says, well, I have you know, such and such problem, and we became fast friends. <laughs> now, you don't have to go into all that detail, but it has been a long time. We have been friends for a long time. We were so young back then, but uh, it's been a great friendship. Yeah, I was 39. I was about to turn 40, and I always told myself I knew I was going to have to quit drinking when I turned 40. And um, I didn't quite make it to 40. I said, God gave us a lifetime supply of alcohol. And I went through mine in the first 40 years. <laughs> yes. But that kind of bonded us together when we first met each other because Robin and I could confide in each other and we could talk to each other and encourage each other. And so we have been doing that for, I can't believe, almost 20 years now. And we've chaired a ton of events to get together, and a lot of them have had speakers who wrote books. And, you know, there's so much wisdom in all these books. We really thought we need to share it with the community and get everybody's input. There'd be a lot of fun to talk about them. And so this is our first inaugural book club. Yes. When, when Robin first called, I, Robin, I thought, okay, Robin, we have enough going on in our life. We already are in a couple of book clubs, and we're doing good to read the books. But you know, do we really need to start a book club? But when you said there are a lot of people who read these books and it really helps them and it helps that we can all talk about it. And so I, I agree. I think absolutely it was the right thing to do. So thank you for encouraging us to do this. Thanks. Well, um, for those of y'all that don't know me personally, I grew up in an alcoholic family and um, gosh, I think nobody, want, nobody wants to say they're an alcoholic. We do everything we can to, um, you know, I haven't been fired. I haven't lost my job. I haven't gotten a DWI. I can't be an alcoholic. Or, you know, with our children, they're an Eagle Scout or they made the Dean's List. They can't be a drug addict. When in reality, you know, that might be how they're studying at night is taking the Adderall and the, you know, pills to Absolutely. get through it. So um, there were just a lot of misconceptions about addiction, and we want to talk about that. Well, and when I met Robin, I had grown up in a family where we kept no alcohol. We really didn't know people. It was everything was so quiet. And so I had never been around any alcoholics. So when Robin told me she was an alcoholic, I kind of stepped back and I thought, okay, what is my role here? I always wanted to be careful around Robin. I wanted to make sure that, you know, if we were with a group, that if people were drinking, that it it wouldn't bother her. But one of the things that Robin taught me is that, you know, this happens in every family or friends. It is a disease. And if you think it's not happening in your family or with your friends, you're wrong. Well, and one of the things, you know, we try everything, you know, AA is the last place I want to be, trust me. So it's like, gosh, I'm really drinking too much, but I'm just going to drink on the weekends. And then I found out, you know, Monday through Thursday, I'm missing the joy and not being present for my kids because I'm so worried about three more days till Friday, two more days till Friday. Um, just missing what's in front of me because I couldn't wait to be able to drink on the weekend. Yeah. Well, Robin, we are so glad that you came up with this idea and we're all thankful for your transparency and we appreciate that. One of the things that I really appreciate when you took me to the Al-Anon meeting is that I learned about the three C's and the people I had known who were drinking, I kept thinking, why don't they just stop? Just, you know, just stop. And I would feel so bad thinking, well, if I did this for them, but in Al-Anon, I learned about the three C's that first of all, I didn't cause it. I can't cure it and I can't, I can't control it and I can't cure it. And so as much as I'm worrying myself about trying to keep help others stay sober it's not it's not me I can't control it right and you know we threw out also some people refer to them as the three G's get off of their back get out of the way get on with your life <laughs> I love that um gosh also um when my parents got sober my mom sat us down and she told us y'all I'm responsible for your scarring but you are each responsible for your own healing and I'm here to help you, but you're, you need to take responsibility. 
Those are such wise words. I, I really never knew that we'd have said that until you just mentioned <laughs> it. Your parents were great how they were open about this. And I think those are, are great words of wisdom for anyone going through this. So Robin, tell us, how did you come up with the first book for our Reading and Recovery Book Club? Well, the Recovery Resource Council is having an event next Wednesday at, let's see, it's, is it 1030? 10. 10, 10 to 11.30 with Laura Ball, and she's speaking at the height on her book, Out of the Rough. And we thought, let's drum up some interest for people to go hear Laura. And, you know, I started reading it, and it was an amazing story. And I'm surprised that it hadn't been made a movie. I mean, I, I expect to see it as a lifetime movie now. Well, it <laughs> might be after we talk about it today. It's been 20 years since the book was written, but it is still uh, so appropriate today. Everything is great. Well, Robin, I'm glad you mentioned about the event, and we look forward to that, and we're going to introduce you to our guests. But before I introduce you to the guests, Robin and I do want to say thank you to Cynthia Smoot, Alicia Peoples, and Candace Stovall. Yes. We, we had this idea. We have done this without them. We had an idea that we could just go on Facebook Live and make this happen, and it really doesn't work that way. Robin and I can yeah. barely turn on it, our computers. It still might not work, but it's not their fault if so, it doesn't. So. so anyway, we do want to thank these, these three for their help. So the first person I'd like to introduce you to is Alicia Peoples. Alicia is the Development of Director at Recovery Resource Council. We really appreciate you being here, and we especially appreciate you guiding us through this <laughs> first, first inaugural book club. Yes. Well, you guys are so fun. So first, it, I have to remember that this is work. Um, <laughs> but um, we're just so excited that you are so passionate about recovery and about helping the community. Um, recovery Resource Council serves 19 counties. So that's a lot of ground to cover. Wow. So it really is. Thank you. It really is. And our other guest is Lauren Gillette. And, you know, one of the great things about recovery is some of my best friends are 20 years older than me, and some are 20 not years younger than me. <laughs> not, not, not this one. But, you know, you, you make friends that your past would never cross if it weren't for the doors of recovery. And Lauren's one of those people that I just love, and I'm so blessed to have met her. Thank you. Thank you guys for having me. I know. We are so thrilled you're here. I love it. Um, so I'm Lauren Gillette, and I have been sober since January 28, 2003. So I'm coming up on my 18th um, birthday. Congratulations. Um, thank you. Um, I'm an alcoholic and an addict and also a super grateful member of Al-Anon. So a little bit about me. I grew up in a uh, family of seven. And I always thought I was a little bit different, um, kind of felt like the black sheep. And, um, you know, I was introduced to alcohol at a pretty young age, about 14 or 15. And I remember um, my first drunk, I, it, was, it was like a Thursday afternoon. It was at my parents' lake house in Canada. And my mom had gone in town and my friends were over and we decided to have some shots and we opened my parents um liquor cabinet and we drank a little of everything that we saw and within you know 30 minutes to an hour i was spinning and nauseous and you know soon soon after i was you know vomiting all over and um and that was my first drunk i mean i it was it was awful and i vowed i will never do this again and you know what the next day <laughs> I started drinking again, and that's just how it goes is for an alcoholic. Um, you know, I, I learned that alcohol helped me numb out. It made me feel more attractive. It made me feel smarter and, you know, a part of the group. I would drink before I went out, and it got really bad. By the time I was 18, I was a daily drinker, and um, by the grace of God, I became sober at 24 and haven't learned haven't looked back so thank you guys for having Thanks. me it's thank so fun you. to be here well we are so glad that you've joined us today lauren alicia and we're really glad that you on facebook have joined us so one of the good things robin and i've talked about about a book club you don't always have to read the book to go and have fun so even if you haven't read the book hang on and go 
with the book, go through the book with us. Robin's going to give us a little synopsis of the book, and then we will go into questions and talking about some of the questions that you have that you would like to type in. Yes. I used to, for my book club, I would show up without reading it, and if it sounded good when everybody talked about it, then I would read it. So a lot of y'all, if you haven't read the book and you want to read it, I have a copy. I'm happy to loan it to you. Um, as we learned in this book, um, Laura, she made, made it through seven pregnancies all nine months without drinking and you know I thought gosh you know if I didn't know better you couldn't be an alcoholic if you could easily make it nine months seven times without drinking I just thought that was incredible I thought it was really interesting she titled her first chapter ordinary people <laughs> she didn't drink until she was 20 I mean she wasn't you know mm -hmm. one of those and that was back when you know drugs were freely flowing and she never tried drugs she played golf every day with her brothers. Her father was her golf coach. Um, they just seemed like the perfect American family. You know, And but that's another thing. What looks perfect on the surface is not always how it is. Behind closed doors, she said there was name calling, fighting, accusations. Her parents, you know, were really in turmoil. And she was basically raised by her brother, Hale. And he's seven years older than her. So when Hale goes to college and her other brother's 16, her parents decide to divorce. And they send, um, they, her mother decides to move to California with Laura, leaving the, all of her family. So just her and her mother alone, you know, pack up and move to California. They live on a shoestring budget. They don't own a TV. They don't own a phone. I mean, I just can't even imagine. Um, she's trying to play her golf and, um, you know, I think there has to be a lot of trauma mm -hmm. back there Absolutely. that shows up later. Uh, she gets a, she's winning in golf. She's the LPGA youngest U.S. amateur woman ever. She wins all her junior tournaments. And she gets an offer through Rolex to go to Japan yeah. and play. And she says she's at the airport and she doesn't even have enough money for a sandwich. And I thought, gosh, I can imagine sending a 17-year-old, you know, my daughter, you know, anywhere I just it just yeah. blows me away so anyway um she continues pursuing her golf aspirations and um when she's 20 she has um her first drink with Bobby Cole and I can't believe she had never drank him before she later ends up marrying a man she refers to him as Will in the book and he is physically abusive verbally and physically abusive to her and again that trauma that you know you just don't get over if you don't work through it she divorces will and ends up marrying bobby cole they um have a dysfunctional relationship he's not working she they go on to have seven kids and she's just continu continuing to drink thinking she has everybody fooled yes Okay. Do you want to comment on that, or you want me well, to go <laughs> we, Well, go ahead, because now you have it towards the end of the story. Tell okay. what happened. Well, she does. Yeah. She has a near-death experience, and they force her into treatment, and she goes. But the day she gets out, she goes to the grocery store and buys alcohol. And, you know, she's continuing to drink. And then one day, she is thinking she hit her head. She's bleeding out of, you know... Her head and then all of a sudden her fingernails her toenails her eyes mm -hmm. her ears they call it bleeding out and most people don't survive that when that happens she finds herself in the hospital and she really thinks she's gonna die she goes to the Betty Ford Center and it's there that she finds out she has an incurable disease and yes. the good news is there is a treatment for it and that's never drinking again that's right great synopsis mm -hmm. thank you mm -hmm. So, so, um, let's see, Alicia. Well, well, Lauren, tell us what do you what did you find most impactful about Laura's story? Um, for me, what I could relate to was the denial piece. You know, she refers to the fact that this isn't something new. She um, suffers these major health traumas over and mm -hmm. over, and thinks. Well, next time it's not gonna. It, it's it won't. It'll be different this time. It's that unmanageability of um, what alcohol yeah. does to us, and and we rationalize it, thinking, oh, it's just not that bad. It's 
it's um, I can control this. You know, I don't want to be different than my friends. So I thought that was really, you know, as an alcoholic, I understand that. But most people would think, oh, my gosh, this happened to her and she still yes. kept drinking. Like, that is yes. crazy. And that yes. you have to, that she would have to put minis of wine beside her bed in case she woke up in the middle of the night because, uh -huh. you know, she'd have the shakes. Or if she went in, if there was a rain delay and a at a golf tournament, she would need that wine to make it through the rest of the uh, make it through the rest of the game. Yeah. Yeah, that, yeah so, that's definitely one of the things that was most surprising to me is when she talks about waking up every couple of hours and rummaging through the garage to yes. find alcohol. And it's yes. like, wow, you're not sleeping. Yes. And, or eating or anything. So. Okay. <laughs> wow. So we have asked some of you all to send in questions for mm -hmm. us. Yeah. And so, Alicia, do you yes. have the, one of the first questions? That I do. Up? Um, so one of the very first questions, and Robin may have to tell us um, who this question is from, but it's, uh, quote, unquote, why do we do this to ourselves? Oh, I love that. That's from, let's see, Terry in Santa Monica. And why do we do this to ourselves? We do it because we're addicts or we do it because we're alcoholics. And, you know, I remember my father had five kids. He had a great job. He had a beautiful wife. And he had less than 40% of his liver left. And he was told, you will die if you keep, keep drinking. And he was getting drunk every day. And, you know, he was doing it because he's an alcoholic. And that's what alcoholics do. Yeah. And so tell me about the misconceptions of alcoholics. Lauren, like, I know that not being an alcoholic, I know you talk about you think you're hiding it from others. And what there are so many misconceptions. Like you look at Laura Baugh and you think that woman could not be an alcoholic if she is out on the She's golf too course. Pretty. She's yes, life is too good. But tell us a little bit of the misconceptions and some of the things that, that you would do to hide this. Um, you know, well, first of all, I think for me I only hung out with people who drank like I did because it made me feel less shameful of my own behavior. Well, it, I'm not that bad because all my friends drink the same way I do. So if I'm an alcoholic, they're all al alcoholics also. So that doesn't make sense. Um, you know, I know no one was diagnosed with um, alcoholism in my, in my family. And so I just would view it as this you know, person that lived under the bridge yes. or, you know, someone that struggled with mental illness or, um, you know, you, you don't see, you don't look at someone like Laura and think she, when I see her, I think she looks so perfect. Surely she's not an alcoholic because yes. how would you, how would you have your hair fixed and your makeup put on and not be so disheveled unless you were an alcoholic? So I guess outward appearances can sometimes, you know, cover up what we're really struggling from deep down. Yes. And we've heard from speakers over the years that, you know, have flown airplanes drunk, have, you know, showed up at sporting events drunk, mm -hmm. and, yep. you know, none of us knew. I mean, yes. and, and even with Laura Baugh is doing the commercials, and some of you might remember she was did the commercials for Ultra Bright. And that takes me back to the days. I remember those commercials where this beautiful blonde was on the golf course and they would say something and that beautiful smile, she would answer. And it's so hard to believe that Laura Baugh during this time was doing these commercials and making, you know, winning golf matches, but all of this being able to hide it. Or that's just it. Was she hiding it? Well, I think you, you do for a while until you don't. And, you know, I remember thinking, oh, my kids, you know, I'm pouring a glass of wine at 4 o'clock while they're doing their homework, and they won't know because I have it in a styrofoam cup. It's not in my wine glass. And, you know, they have noses. They can smell. I mean, Absolutely. you know, you're not hiding it from anyone. Lauren, what about, what about you? What were some of your tricks that you thought you were hiding it from people? Because you had to hide it from your parents being so young drinking, I would think. Exactly. So I would move states. So if my parents were in North Carolina, I was in Texas. If they were in Kansas City, I was in Oklahoma. If they were in Dallas, I was in Europe. So I thought 
that it, as long as no one saw me drink like I was drinking, then I could hide it. Yes. But it came to the point where when people would try to call me, I wouldn't answer because I would isolate. I would feel that shame and the depression would sit in and I would think, oh my gosh, I'm too embarrassed about this, but I'm so embarrassed that I don't want to ask for help even yes. though I need help. And I just surrounded myself with people who were just like me. And so of course they're not gonna call me out on my stuff either. So um, it got to the point where my family would not speak with me anymore. I mean, my parents were really worried, but my siblings, you know, saw what they saw, and it um, it was enough for them to say we can't yeah. be with her anymore. We can't stand her behavior. Well, you touched on something. You said you know the depression would set in, and I think it's a catch twenty two because so many of us you know, drink because we're depressed and then alcohol is a depressant. And so then, you know, you're just more depressed and it just, the cycle keeps going and going and going. Yes. And being able to, like one of the things Laura said in um, the book is that her hands would start shaking. And so that's kind of hard to hide from people when it's something physical, like your hand shaking. But one of the quotes that we pulled out from the book, one of the things that Laura said is, she worried how she would get her wine if Central Florida was hit by a major hurricane or occupied by a foreign force. She went on to say, I remember the sirens going off in our neighborhood to seek shelter. I got both kids and our lab and my bottle of my bottle of wine. No, that's me that did that. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> I put a mat down as yeah, Laura. No, that's me. <laughs> so she said but she, she worried so about a kids. tropical storm happening. Yes, she would worry about that, and that was one of the things. So, Robin. Which I put that in there because I thought it was so funny because I vividly remember, you know, my kids being in kindergarten and second grade and those sirens in the Park cities going off, take shelter, and I get our big chocolate lab and both kids and my bottle of wine, and we go under the stairs into our little bitty closet, and my son looked at me and said, Mom, do you really need the wine? Yes, I really, yes, do. I really do. You know, I really do. So how do you parent in that situation? If you are an alcoholic and you're having a hard time, I guess, staying awake or being present, how do you parent through this? Not very well. Not very well. <laughs> well, I don't know that I agree with that because I know you're They turned out children. okay in spite of it yes. all, but yeah. Yes. But yeah. that's one of the things we're wondering how. But I, you know, I remember, I mean, it's a terrible way to live, and I know, like, I was an alcoholic that got off on the top floor. I didn't, you know, have any major things happen. Didn't lose a husband or my kids or, you know, a job and all of that. But still, like, if it was a wedding where you couldn't drink, well, that's boring. I don't, why would I go? Not yeah. because it's a good friend getting married who I love and want to, you know, show Absolutely. my happiness for. But, um, you know, that would be boring and I wouldn't want to do it. Well, what about when you had little family dinners going out to eat? Did you have your favorite places? <laughs> <laughs> okay, we, so my husband worked a lot when the kids were young, you know, and I would meet friends out for dinner, but we could never go to McDonald's so the kids could play in the playground because they didn't serve wine there. We would go to Slider and Blues or a place called Easy's that was on Northwest Highway in Hillcrest, and, you yes. know, um, I could get my wine, and they had good kids' menus, and Absolutely. it's so sad that that was how we determined where we were going for dinner. So ha after you quit drinking... What was the difference in your family? What what kind of differences did you notice with your interaction with the kids and what the way they treated you? And Well, you know, I'd asked my kids, I think when I got my one-year AA chip, I asked my daughter, then she was, I guess, almost in fourth grade, um, what difference do you see? And she said, well, Mom, you don't fall asleep when you're telling us stories at night. I would sometimes wake up at two in the morning and I'd fall mm -hmm. asleep with my clothes on in bed with them telling them a story. And... Who has what and, I told him for kids? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and if you certainly don't remember the story. No, I don't them. remember the story. <laughs> no. Okay. Do you have any things, Lauren, that happened to you? Um, gosh. About with the kids or just with... Well, you were sober before you had kids. Yeah, Lauren that's the thing. I was so young. Um, I guess for me, my alcoholism was um, really bad where I couldn't hold a job. You know, I mean, first I was in college and my drinking became priority over attending class. And so then, you know, I, um, 
I thought, well, maybe I just need to get a job. And of course my drinking took priority over work yeah. and it just got to the point where I was drinking all day, every day and I would drive. I mean, I, I started having some legal problems and um, that's when the unmanageability of the disease started really kicking the doors in for me. Mm -hmm. And it was getting pretty evident that um, I had a problem. I just couldn't function as a normal human being in society anymore. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, um, yeah, I did notice once I got sober, I was a lot more present in their lives. And, you know, for the most part, everybody was very supportive. Nobody's like, oh, you're not, you're well. I did have one friend that you're not an alcoholic. You're just, um, your parents are both in recovery and it's a cult and they talked you into thinking you're one. <laughs> and you know, what I realize now is she was an alcoholic and she was losing her drinking buddy. I mean, we drank a ton um, early on while the kids played in the backyard. She was a neighbor so we could, you know, just uh -huh. drink and not have to get in the car and the kids. Well, that's one of the things I remember when I first met you is that I really worried about you being a recovering alcoholic and were we all going to be bad influences around you? Did that bother you if people were around you drinking? You know, it, it didn't me. I don't know about you, Lauren, but it never bothered me. And for me, I mean, I think God blessed me with the gift of not craving the alcohol early on that if I didn't have it, I didn't need it. But if you told me I could have one glass of wine every day for the rest of my life, I wouldn't want it because one wouldn't be enough. You know, yeah. I, I would rather, it's easy not to drink, it's hard to drink in moderation. Yeah, sure. It's like chips at a Mexican restaurant. Oh, you just geez. don't have one, you're okay. I cannot not have one. That's right. I need the whole basket. You know, but I still have, I'm still, I'm in recovery, but I'm still an alcoholic. And when I'm in a restaurant and there's a half a glass of wine and the waiter comes and's clearing the table, I'm like, oh my gosh, they didn't finish that. It, <laughs> That's it right. bugs me, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Like, wait. I would be finishing one glass before I took the another. You know, I had to have some still in it before they brought the other, yeah. which was yes. crazy. Yeah. Well, one last question, Lauren, before we turn it over to Alicia and see what questions have come in. What did you do to convince yourself that you were not an alcoholic? I mean, how did you try to tell, convince yourself you were not? Um, that's a great question. So I obviously started having a, some emotional issues and I thought, well, you know, it could be depression. Depression runs in my family. So I started seeing a therapist and I was put on antidepressants, but then I was drinking at the same time. And depressant and depressant is a double whammy. Um, it doesn't work. And, you know, obviously I was still really young and I thought, I'm too young to be an alcoholic. I just am a heavy drinker. Yes. Um, and we all know that there are, there are some people, they go to college and they are able to really put down some um, beverages in college, but then they step into the real world, into their career, and, you know, they maybe have one drink yeah a day maybe not I mean they're just they're they don't need it they don't crave it um so I guess the age factor was big for me and um I just it was this rationalization that well I'm not bad enough it's not bad enough because I still had an apartment I lost my life I mean I really pretty much lost everything in my mind I was still telling myself well, you have $10 left and a bottle yes. of wine costs 12 just write a hot check. <laughs> I mean, alcohol was my master when I was done. It had okay. conquered me completely. Okay. Yeah. Well, and, and to kind of piggyback on what you're saying again about the book, um, Laura talks about um, champagne and wine being her drink of choice. Yes. And she says, well, they serve you champagne on a silver platter and people in tuxedo serve it to you. So I'm not That's an alcoholic, right. it's champagne. That's right. Um, <laughs> you know? That's right. And so there's all these things that you can tell yourself to rationalize why yes. you're- And convince yourself. And convince yourself, And right. some people think you have to drink hard liquor to be an alcoholic. I remember my dad was a scotch drinker and he had an incident where he went to the hospital and he quit drinking for a while because he was going to die. And he had a doctor that said, well, you can have a beer every now and then. And alcohol, beer didn't count. You know, it's, right. I think it's like people think that weed doesn't count as drugs. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. that's right. weed. And, but right. um, anyway, pretty soon he was drinking a case a day and yes. getting drunk. Yep. Right. Yep. It's, so, it's, Alicia, mm -hmm. let's 
turn it back over to sure. you and see if any questions have come in. Yeah, well, and here's one question we kind of had before, too, um, that I think would be really, really helpful for the audience. It's, how can the parent of an addict best love his, her adult child in the midst of continued denial and substance abuse? So for, for both of you, too, if you want to speak to, or, or everyone on the panel, like, um, being a parent, but also being the child. So this is a good one. Um, we recently dealt with this very same subject. And, um, you know, coming from an alcoholic home, you know, we've, we've learned, I've learned in recovery that there's a genetic component to this disease. And so we've really tried to educate our children. Here are the warning signs. You know, if you go out drinking, first of all, we would like them not to drink until they're of age, right? Um, if they decide to take a drink and they find they need more and more and more, that is abnormal. That is a red flag. You know, here is our special code that you call and we will pick you up, no questions asked. Um, if they find that once they have one drink, they can't stop, or if they, you know, have some memory losses, which we call a blackout, um, those are major red flags, you know, and so I think today it's all about educating our children when they're young. Um, it's not a taboo subject anymore like it used to be. Well, and I remember, um, you know, both my parents were alcoholic. They got sober when I was in college. I'm one of five kids. My sisters both just don't drink. And, you know, one sister knows that she doesn't drink because she knows that when she does, she drinks too much, but she's not alcoholic. And the other just doesn't drink because it scares her. But I set my son down. I thought he was drinking a little much in college, going through fraternity stuff. And I said, you know, it's genetics, both your grandparents, your mom, you know, you need to really watch it. And he said, mom, you knew both your parents were alcoholics when you were in college and you didn't get sober till you were 40. And this is my path, and maybe I will find out that I am one and will have to quit one day, but I have to go down my own path. And believe it or not, he's not an alcoholic. I mean, yeah, you know, right. it was just kind of one of those social drinking example. in college. But, you know, I did tell him then, that's great, but if you get in trouble, you have to pay the consequences. Mm -hmm. If you get thrown in jail, I'm not bailing you out. If you get a ticket, you're, you're gonna have to pay it and, yep. It goes back to the three C's. You know, we we are just we're only in charge of what's in our hula hoop. Yes. You know, everyone has their own. I'm going to bring that spiritual component in. Everyone has their own higher power who is you know watching over them, and um, we can say it one time, and then that's it. You know, and hopefully they know friends or someone in the community that can help them get the some treatment if they need to go to another level. Yes. Absolutely. Okay. Um, here's another one too. Um, what is the worst or best attempt a friend or loved one has made in an effort to support you? Hmm. And we could even pair that with um, choosing your enablers, kind of back to what That's you were right. saying about how you surround yourself with people who have similar <laughs> behavior. Uh oh, be careful. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I just, you know, um, you know, my husband who. It's like, we're not going to tell anybody when I first got an AA, or I don't really think you're an alcoholic. You just are in a bad habit. After I'd been in a while, um, I'd ordered a club soda with lime, and they brought it, and I spit it out at the table, and it was like a gin and tonic. And he's like, she's an alcoholic. I can't believe you. He started yelling it at the restaurant. And I was like, it's fine. It's fine. You know, I'm like, it didn't trigger anything, but... Um, Gosh, you know, I think, um, like, Jan has showed up to see me get a chip at AA. I've had so many friends show up, you know, different years to show their support. And um, I think it's really neat for them to see. I always love seeing the people that get their one-year chip and have their families there. And I'm just like, gosh, what a gift you're giving those kids. And yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. It's a private club. I mean, you know, <laughs> that has lots of members. Once I, you get in it, you're I like... tell some of my friends are not alcoholic; they're only Al-Anon, and I tell them that they're missing out because we have the best time. We no. have the best stories. Uh -huh. and... Yeah, and that goes back. I thought, oh, I can't drink. I'm never going to have fun again. <laughs> I have not stopped laughing since I've been in recovery. Right. I mean, it's just we have a blast. It's a gift yeah. because we accept 
what we accept our behavior. We go yes. through the steps and we make amends when we need to. And, and then it's just a wash. Then we use our experience to help other people. Yes. And I think that's the gift of recovery programs. 12-step programs worldwide. Absolutely. That was a question somebody did ask me is, what do you have to do to keep your recovery? And and I think Lauren just hit on it. You have to give back to keep it, don't you yes, think? absolutely. And I, I love the way Laura Ball um, gives back by speaking. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I know, you know, she's doing us a huge favor, hopefully by coming on the line today, but by writing a book to help others and mm -hmm. speaking at events and Mm -hmm. And just being transparent. Yes. Being, being real, you know? Yes, yeah. I mean, that's you look I at her and think she's perfect. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's what I was going to say. Um, because I, you guys know my grandfather was an alcoholic. My mother is not. But then a lot of her siblings struggle with drug addiction. Mm -hmm. And they're my cousins. So you have all these people in your family that you really love. And um, unfortunately for me, we were not being transparent. We were not using the word alcoholic with my grandfather and other members of my family. And so it's so refreshing for me to be doing the work that we do at Recovery Resource Council, you know, providing services, helping people get and stay sober because of that transparency. Yes. And it's like, you know, anything in the dark is going to fester. You can't yes. heal. So I love that um, I'm always around a group of people who can be open and know yes. that their mental health, what their issues are. We can just sit here and be like, oh, I was depressed. And so I did this, you know, well, don't rather you, than. Don't you think it's a little bit easier to be open with it today? Like when Betty Ford first came out that she was an alcoholic, people didn't talk about it at it the like time. breast cancer. It you was. know, if you had breast cancer, you whispered it. I mean, it was. Yes. And for someone like Betty Ford to come out and say, I'm an alcoholic. And then other people coming through, like. You, Robin, I mean, it, it has been so great for me because you have been so transparent and I know how hard you work every day and it just makes me appreciate and love you that much more because I know you choose every single day to be the best mom, the best wife, the best friend. <laughs> and everything you can to be the best person. Well, you know, I, I hurt for Laura because, you know, I knew both my parents were in AA, so I knew where to go when I needed help. And, you know, I think here she went through, you know, an abusive relationship. She, the first year of her marriage, she lost a baby at five months, you know, and I thought she didn't have anywhere to go. If she had, at yeah. the time, you know, gone into a recovery program, I just think, it would have helped. Absolutely. But, we, but we also, you know, we haven't brought this up yet. We talk about she had so much trauma in her life. Yes. And it was never addressed. And you can't, you can't just numb it. Like you were yes. saying, you were numbing some. You can't just self-medicate. Yes. You have to walk through the pain to get to the other side. And it may still be there, not, yes. not as sharp, but you have yes. to walk through. And when you're in recovery, you have people doing that with you. Well, and one of the things that like you were talking about giving back, and that's one of the things that both of you do, and Alicia, you do on a daily basis, how you get involved with places like Recovery Resource, Magdalene House, Nexus, Care, 24-Hour Club, and you go out and you give back. And I think that you, you realize, you think you're going out to make yourself feel better, and every time you come out of it and you go, I feel so much better. These people, I thought I was going to make them feel better, but they made me feel better. It's so and so true. I think you two are exceptional about getting out and really working with people. And I think it's a great way for you to, to keep focused and, and Thank stay Well, also, over. you know, um, we work with so many groups, but the staff, Recovery Resource <laughs> has amazing staff. Nobody is working in recovery for a paycheck. I mean, yes. it's amazing. These people give. And um, I remember saying to one of the workers at Nexus, you know, the best gift I got besides the birth of my children was my father getting sober. I didn't really start forming a relationship with him till I was, you know, in college. Mm -hmm. And I said, y'all are giving these children that back. Yes. I mean, you're giving them their parent back. And what better gift? Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And the, well, resources, yes. right? the resources, right? The resources yes. to deal with what's going on in your life yes. and to take control. So, okay. yeah. Well, as we're kind That's of... That's our payment. 
Were there any Idiot. more questions to you? I want to see if oh, were. yes, before we wind down. Yeah. Were any more questions coming through? Alicia? Yeah, you know, there were, I had a few too, and I don't know if we kind of hit on this, but I wondered kind of what was most impactful about the book. Like, what part of the book did you feel like just, you know, made you feel like you knew Laura? <sighs> <laughs> For me, it was the um, the description of bleeding out. Oh. I mean, that just, I couldn't believe that mine didn't get that bad health-wise. And um, by the grace of God, it didn't get bad, that bad. Um, I was young and my body was, I guess, you know, strong enough to deal with the actual alcoholism. And it's funny now because my hairdresser, who's younger than me, says... Well, your hair, you know, it's still from the effects of 20 years ago, <laughs> Lala. And I'm like, Rachel, oh my gosh. Um, she loves to dig that in. Because it really, you know, even though it cleans up your liver and everything else is fine, when you do, when you drink this much and you do this many drugs, like, it, we don't really know the effects. I mean, some people say it causes yes. Alzheimer's. You can contribute to these other diseases mm -hmm. when you're much older. And um, so the health when Laura wrote about all the, um, you know, health traumas yes. that she dealt with, I just, I was kind of blown away. And, yeah. and you know, there was a big Al-Anon component because, mm -hmm. you know, I grew up, you know, I made good grades. I didn't, you know, break the rules because I didn't want to disappoint my parents. I was a people pleaser. And you see that in Laura. I yes. mean, she tries for 20 years, you know, she keeps just being disappointed herself by not winning a tournament. And, I feel like she's trying to please everybody. She's trying to yes. please her sponsors. She's trying to please her husband. She has all these kids. And I just, yes. gosh. And it never got to be just about mm -hmm. Laura. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, as we are winding down our discussion um, about all the rough, Robin, what is one of the quotes that you really loved from her oh. that would stick with you? Where is it? Show me. because It's I can't right find it. oh, here. Okay. I loved in the book. My favorite quote is Laura says, my highs have been in the heavens and my lows have been close to hell. And I just had flashbacks. My father um, had said to me, AA doesn't open the gates to heaven to let us in. It opens the gates of hell to let us out. And I just love that. That, that is fabulous. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, well, and I can just say a little bit too, you know, you, we've mentioned all of these agencies that provide recovery um, services. And um, for us at Recovery Resource Council, you can um, email info at recoverycouncil.org um, to get help or if you know someone that needs help. Um, like I said, we provide services in 19 counties and we do everything from um, referrals to outpatient treatment. Um, and I think what's key too and something we haven't really talked a lot about is that and, and in the midst of the pandemic, this is even like exacerbated, but the lack of resources. Mm -hmm. um, so sometimes it can be really hard to yes. access the mental health that you need or in the yes. treatment that you need. So we provide that free of charge or for, you know, if you're struggling financially, that's available. But again, I can't say enough about this panel too, because um, all of these ladies every day are in the community fundraising and making sure that people that don't have um, resources are able to still get the... Yeah. The treatment that they need okay well and um, that you know brought up something the resources you provide because both lauren and i were in positions you know my dad i remember calling him when i had my last you know drink the next morning and crying and telling him you know about my bottom out and him, he said you know there's help we can send you to betty ford i get a discount i'm on the advisory board you know Lauren and I both had financial resources to go to a treatment center if we chose or to get counseling. And we had family that was supportive, mm -hmm. friends that wanted us to stay sober. I mean, I have friends that say, you know, you may go out, but you're not going out on my watch. You know, they're not going to ever have a drink with me. And the people that go to Recovery Resource and Nexus and the 2-4 and Magdalene House, all these places yes. don't have that. Some of them have, you know, have no financial means. A lot of them have lost their homes because of drinking, lost their jobs. And, you know, this is a resource for them to get back on their feet. Absolutely. Absolutely. And like you said, get, um, get family, but also connection, right? Because yes. the antidote to addiction is, um, is connection and community. So. And it's so interesting. Lauren and I both go with a group out to Nexus, and we do neck and shoulder massages for the women once a month, and we do like eight minutes for each of them. 
And, you know, at the end, they'll say, oh, do you have a business card? Or I've never had a professional <laughs> massage. And we're like, oh, baby, we're just alcoholics like you, you know. And they give us a big hug, and they just can't believe it. But, you know, that's just another way to give back. Yeah. And Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's invaluable. Yeah. So. Good. Yeah. Well, do you want to talk about um, our book for the, until yes. we hear from Laura? Are we still waiting to hear from Laura? Okay. okay. Well, tell we're, about our book next month. We're going to go on and thank you so much for joining us in, joining in with us in this book club. So Robin and I have decided for our next book club that we're going to stick with an athlete because there have been a lot of athletes who have gone through recovery. We but, have but this was all alcohol, and the next one's going to be more drugs. Yes, and we've <laughs> seen um, David Faraday and Charles Haley and so many people going through this, but of course we are excited to announce that our next book is going to be Basketball Junkie. And we're very excited about this. We've chosen Basketball Junkie. It's written by Chris Heron and Bill Reynolds. At age 17, Chris already was a national sports figure. He was highly recruited by major universities, and he, he realized his childhood dream of getting to play for the Boston Celtics. But his success concealed a darker side. First alcohol, then cocaine, then painkillers, and finally heroin consumed his talent and derailed his career. But Basketball Junkie, you can go online and order the book. Also, Chris was the subject of ESPN Films Unguarded. It's a documentary about that. life yes, and recovery that's from addiction. And so we hope that you will read this, and we will be announcing our date on Facebook in the next and, couple and of days. And what I love about Chris's story, which I tell my kids this all the time, you know, a lot of people can go out and try cocaine or try something and they're fine and never pick it up again. But Chris tried cocaine in college and was immediately hooked. And that yeah. was the end. Yeah. Okay. And, and you know, the other thing too, other opportunities to connect. Um, so anyone that makes a donation today through the book club will be able to hear Laura read at our VIP event on the 15th uh, next week. And then of course she will be here live um, on the 16th at the Hyatt. We will be, um, Following all of the CDC guidelines and um, the hotel guidelines, we'll be handing out masks. There will be hand sanitizer everywhere. We're not serving food, again, to be safe. So um, we want to invite you to come out. It'll be a... Yeah, she's on the line now. Okay. Yeah, we want to invite you to come out to hear her live. And then on the 21st, um, you'll be able to listen virtually. So um, now we have our speaker, Laura Baugh. And... Um, <laughs> Hi! 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 How are you? You're still adorable. You're oh my best. gosh, so cute and young looking. Yes. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Uh, can Can you hear me and everything? Yes, we loved your book. Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And we're really excited to see you in person next week and to hear your story. I know there are several things that we're looking forward to hearing the after story. So can you give us a little glimpse of what has happened in the past 20 years since the book? Well, um, you know, I wrote the book when I was newly sober. Uh, so it's pretty green and, and brutal and, and, and uh, uh, accurate. Okay. Um, since then, you know, life has just been beyond my wildest dreams. I, I had uh, another child. Uh, I have seven children. My last child was born in sobriety. Um, I, I went on to, after playing the LPGA Tour for 20 years, I, I did TV for 10. And now I've been blessed to be uh, teaching for teaching golf for about seven. And I've just opened up my Laura Ball Golf Schools um, in uh, Northern Florida. And I can customize my lessons to suit any student's uh, desires, dreams, uh, whatever goals they have. So, you know, I, I keep uh, living a, a life of uh, setting goals and, and uh, reaching some of them and, and continuing to journey toward others. And none of that would have been possible without your sobriety, correct? Oh, absolutely not. You know, my last drinking episode, my, my bottom, my, my three prayers were to... Um, live long enough to find someone to care for my seven children. Uh, I only had six children at that time, someone to care for my six children. I didn't want to die an alcoholic in a, uh, in a hospital. 
and I had been uh, beaten up and I didn't want the person that had done that to face any criminal charges. So those three were my three goals. Um, and I little did I know I would live uh, over 24 years later. Uh, I'm talking to you today. Yes. Wow. Yeah. Okay, so Robin and I'd like to know, do you think you could teach us to play golf? <laughs> We might just have Absolutely. To <laughs> you know, the main thing about golf is we get you to a level to where you enjoy it. And that's a level for diff uh, different for everyone. Yes. But the main thing is that as you in as you learn to enjoy it more and more on different levels, you might want to keep going. And, and the main thing about golf is that you get to spend time with family and friends and sometimes business people. And uh, it's a great opportunity. And in this pandemic, it has been a lifesaver for so many. Yes. Have you stayed close to your brothers since you got sober? My brothers, yes. And, and it is their own journey. Uh, um, we kind of, uh, they have gone on. Some of them, uh, you know, one of them still struggles with uh, alcohol from time to time. Uh, the other one never really had a problem, uh, but I think that they have uh, always been proud, but actually quite surprised that I have stayed sober, you know, as long as I have. Yeah. Wow. And what do you attribute, I'm sorry, I'm hogging the questions, but I just <laughs> love her. What do you attribute your long-term sobriety to? Well, I think it's a, a gift of God. Um, I think I was uh, given the opportunity to continue to live a life of sobriety, um, hopefully to help another alcoholic, if it's one, if it's two, if it's a hundred, however many. Um, I've never thought that I was that unique or that special. So I think that I am, am able to be of service. And that's been my, my point of view from day one. Well, we appreciate that. Um, your book was such an inspiration to us, and we love the fact that you are giving back now, and we are so excited to see you <laughs> next you. week. I think um, Alicia told us about the event, and some of us will get to see you in person, but if not, they will be able to sign on online and see you virtually. And my mother saw you years ago at um, a recovery resource event speaking and said you were so good, so she's excited. Thank you. Thank you. I, you know, I, I really feel like if you keep it, if you keep it green, then you'll stay sober. If you think that because you have 24 plus years, uh, you're not susceptible to the next drink, then you're fueling yourself. And I, I think, you know, I know because I have friends in the program um, that uh, relapsed after 30 years. So you've okay. got to keep it, uh, you've got to keep it green. You've got to stay in the center of the bed. You don't want to fall off. And and for that, you know, I learned from others and uh, I take it one day at a time. I love that, stay in the center of the bed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely, right. absolutely. Right. Yeah. Well, and we did have one question um, that I think would be good to tee up uh, next week, but you know, someone wanted to know about, it's so impressive the level of athlete that you've always been. Um, and then kind of what's happening in the field now, like what's happening with professional golf or things that you're seeing to help players with their mental health um, or other types of addiction that they're struggling with. Well, I, I think that's an awesome question. I think we can always do better. I think especially in these uh, uncertain times, I think a lot of people are struggling with being shut down or not being able to, to be with their family and friends and support groups, go to meetings. Uh, sometimes Zoom meetings are awesome. Sometimes they need more. So, uh, and I think, you know, al uh, alcohol, you know, affects everyone. It doesn't matter whether you're a fantastic athlete, uh, uh, you know, a, a doctor, a lawyer, it doesn't matter. It affects us all. So I think that the, the thing that is, is the most inspirational is knowing someone that has been there before you, it, sharing your experience, strength, and hope. You know, golf, LPGA golf, especially is an international sport. You know, we come from all parts of the globe. We come from all backgrounds. We come from, we, we all attend the struggles and, and, and hope that, you know, tomorrow's a bright day. So, um, you know, I, I, I hug my fellow um, uh, people in sobriety, even if it's virtually. So uh, I think that, that you know, we, we just take one day at a time. Great. 
Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. We are so excited to see you live next week. <laughs> we week. can't and wait. Thank you. Thank you for being thank so you. giving. Thank yeah. You. Thank you and so much. Thank you. Look forward to seeing you all. Thank you. Do we take the headset off now? Okay. <laughs> we hope that uh, you enjoyed your time with us today. Be sure to follow us on Facebook. We will be reading in recovery. Yep. Yes, reading in recovery. And we did have a message from Chris Heron today, since he's aware that we're going to be uh, reading his book. Jane just needed an excuse to reach out to him. <laughs> oh, yes, that's surprised. it. That's it. Anyway, Chris said, my greatest accomplishment is my recovery and the willingness to share it openly and honestly. Not only the struggle and despair, but the strength I found in sobriety. I am truly grateful and blessed to be where I am today. I have been supported by many. So we look forward to reading the book. Thank you, Laura Ball. We are so excited to meet her in mm -hmm. person next week. And y'all can still get your tickets to come yes. see us all there and Laura. And, yes. Yes. and so fun. I guess we are wrapping up the first book club. How do you think we did? Well, I'd love for anybody, anybody give us feedback, any, the things we're doing wrong, let us know. This is our first one. We want to fix it and, Absolutely. you know, just Absolutely. send us your feedback. We'd love it. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you for being with us today and we will see you next month. Keep Thank coming you. back. It works if you work it. <laughs>